Hello, everyone. Uh, so today we're going to uh, spend some time uh, talking about the content triangle, which I'll go into in a second. But first, if uh, each of you could just introduce yourselves, start with Farah. Um, Farah Sihan, I head up the Group of Entertainment Business in Indonesia. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Christensen. I lead uh, Content Plus for Mind Asia Pacific. Uh, my name is Mark Heal. I'm sales director of IFA Media. We're a Singaporean-based uh, TV production company, and we have offices in Beijing, Taipei, and Bangkok as well. Uh, Guillaume Sachet, I head strategy at MediaCorp. I'm also the head of uh, one of the small business, business units, uh, Foodies. I guess they had no choice to take a French to head Foodies. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, so, the content triangle. Um, as we've been talking about content, oh great, the graphic is up. The content triangle. So for us, uh, as we were speaking about how Group M Entertainment might fit into the business, and more on what Group M Entertainment is in a bit, um, we came up with describing it exactly this way. It's not rocket science. I mean, we all know this. We're all in the industry. But typically, every piece of content that is created has a producer, so the content creation, you have a media platform or distribution, and then you have media agencies and brands who are bringing the revenue or the financing. Fairly standard. Now, historically, this triangle was much more like an inverted V, um, where a platform, a channel, would commission a piece of content, so the producer would make something, deliver it to the channel, the channel would then send it on down to their uh, sales department where it would get monetized with a media agency, a brand selling advertising or sponsorships. Fairly standard. And typically, what was represented there was a divide in the industry, typically found in that channel between the programming team and the ad sales team. Massive divide. And that whole industry, think of all of you guys out there who are producers or uh, distributors. When was the last time you actually spoke to the ad sales people? You're speaking to the programming people or the acquisitions people. And yet within the, in the channel, the ad sales people are the ones who are actually making all the money. So it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, different uh, way of thinking about content than most people in the distribution and content creation think about um, in terms of monetizing. Now, Lately, the triangle, the inverted V, has become a triangle where you have brands working with producers. You have all kinds of new relationships and new changes to this traditional model. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so first off, I just want to address that idea um, of the division of you know, ad sales versus programming within the channel. Because that was the fundamental for me, that break in the industry. And now I, I wanted to ask. Guillaume, if you want to take that on and just have a little chat about it from a channel perspective. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, we are, we are not just the channel, we are also the production. So MediaCorp, we have two uh, of the three part of the triangles, right? Uh, the other thing that you haven't mentioned, but the audience is at the center uh, of the triangle and, and we have tried through our reorganization to be much more focused on, on the audience. So now back to your question. Um, the issue between ad sales and programming, I find is really timing, is at which point of time uh, do you engage uh, your ad sales, do you engage the brand in your content production process, right? Because at the end of the day, more and more you want content that is uh, appealing to the audience, but you also want content that will sell, uh, that brands will want to be associated with, right? And if you just produce the content working with the, between the programming and the production, and then only go to the brand, usually you're, it's just like you try to sell uh, a, a product to someone, not a solution. So we are now much more focusing on can we sell solution to the brands, which is uh, the content, which audience you want to target, and then associate the brand. And how does that work in, uh, when you're commissioning? I mean, aside from working in your own in-house, I could see how that would be very, uh, you know, the synergies would be there. But working, say, with a, a third-party production company, how, how does that change the mix, the dynamics of that? Well, <coughs> it's slightly more complicated because you have a third party. But at the end of the day, again, right, you need to do 
the, the, the engagement with the brands at the very early stage because you have a whole cycle of, of sales and, 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 and uh, review of your content that needs to associate the brand and you need to work closely with the production houses uh, at the very early stage, which is what we are trying to do uh, more and more. Uh, it's not perfect yet, but we are, we are getting there. So, so one of the things we're exploring here today is the um, how how this has been changing, um, and already you know you have a, a channel that has their own in-house production. They do use third party. They do acquire. It's it's a, it's already a mix. So they're already bleeding into other parts of the of the of the corner. Now, um, one of the things that that has drastically changed is it, basically technology. Obviously, has changed things considerably, so that channels are no longer just they're not the only gatekeeper to distribution. So there are other methods. Um, and you know, brands are now speaking directly to production companies and creating content that they may or may not take to a channel. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, Mark, about um, that relationship. As a producer, working with, directly with brands, how is that working uh, compared to, say, how it historically uh, worked for you? Um, well, I think there's been a lot of talk about uh, producers working directly with brands. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I think that, that uh, producers working exclusively and, and directly with, with brands, I think in a way that that's, uh, you we're going to see perhaps slightly less of that, I think. Because the reason I say that is because I think several things have changed in the last few years. Um, I think, first of all, the... Uh, channels have uh, realized that content is the only game in town. And um, whereas a few years ago, channels uh, were tempted to take uh, uh, brand-funded content and simply play it out, that it doesn't work like that anymore. Um, they're much more integrated, and the sales team are selling content as much as they are ad space. So as a producer, there's no, there's no point in making a piece of content if it doesn't get shown anywhere. And wherever it's shown, it needs some kind of media plan around it and support around it. And I think one thing that brands have learned is there's no point in just pushing content out there. So as a production, uh, as, a, as a production house, we have to work with uh, channels, with media agencies, um, to make a sustainable model that works for brands. So um, from my side, Yes, we, we are talking direct to, uh, to brands, but we always have to be working as part of a mix, I, I, I believe, in any case, because um, for, 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 um, for branded content campaigns to work going forward, you know, they, they have to be part of uh, a, a media mix, distribution strategy, and increasingly these days, um, a, a data strategy as well, which is led from media agencies. Um, and at the end of the day, the media agency is going to know their brands better than I ever will, and uh, a channel is going to know their audience better than I ever will. What we can do, I feel strongly, is um, bring a, uh, talking about the center of the triangle, is bring an, uh, a, a creative uh, delivery, in other words, something which, which viewers are going to want to watch. And I think it's our job to make sure that we're delivering that because it's fine talking about brands, it's fine talking about data and all the rest of it. There's no point whatsoever if at the end of the day the show isn't watched and therefore the production house has to bring that creative skill to make sure that at the end of the day the content is watched. Otherwise, what's the point? Mikhail, I mean, as the other side of that, uh, from a media agency's perspective, what's your take on, on this? Um, I think um, Mark raises a few few points in there. So our brand's going to continue to invest and work directly with producers. For sure, I think so. Our brand's going to continue to fund formats like uh, Got Talent or put two, three million dollars into own a big production for the 45 minute, 14, 15 episodes. Probably not. But when you start looking at short form content, webisodic content, etc., they're certainly going to continue to work production houses. Uh, and then find the right platforms to carry the content instead of being forced into a specific platform. Two, two questions there that I want to unpack a bit. One, one about uh, scale and the other one about platform. 
So on the scale side, um, you know, you, you raise the issue of, of a brand not wanting to fund 19 episodes or, you know, a $4 million production or something. Um, what's at the root of that? Uh, honestly, I mean, in terms of... of Cause, cause the they, money. Cause, well, it is money. It is money. <laughs> but a, was it? Reason. Was it? Okay, let me rephrase yeah. that. Was is it? Because it was. It seemed to be working successfully to some extent, but apparently it, it isn't. So where where is the gap there, and why um, has it shifted to smaller projects? Is it because you can spread more across more, or is it? What is it? Um, that's a pretty tough question, I think. Sorry. But um, <laughs> a few a few reasons, I think. So first of all. We have worked with a few clients dealing with these massive projects. And as a client or a, as a marketing organization, they're not set up to be content production companies. They're not set up to run production and running production and finding other co-investors to help them offset some risk, maybe get rid of some extra inventory they don't, can't use up themselves internally. It takes a lot of organizational focus away from what it is they do well, which is marketing and selling their products. So for them, it's to simplify it from their end. Um, but we are seeing some companies who are setting up their own in-house studios or getting directors into their companies to be able to do these things. But I don't think it's going to be as common as it was four or five years ago. But I think there's a crucial difference between the, t the two kinds of things. And I, I come back to this, um, this differentiation between creating content that people actually want to watch as opposed to creating short-form pieces of content where viewers have to be driven towards them from a media plan. Because that, for me, is heading back towards a, almost like an interruptive, uh, you know, 30 seconds spots, that would like, like in the old days. Um, if you're making a show that people really want to watch, it's a, it's a Got Talent or something equivalent to that, that's content which, which has a, a life of its own. And I can understand and see why brands want to get involved in that because they're associating themselves with something which, um, which viewers love and they're going to watch anyway. And of course, everyone wants to piggyback off that. If you're simply making bits of content which, um, which a, a media agency or, or some kind of media plan has to drive the consumer towards, uh, towards watching so that the marketing department can tick it off, that's a very different kind of approach. Um, and, and one's branded entertainment, and the other one of which is, I don't know, content marketing. And, and the two things, are, to my mind, are quite different. So the second part of that um, um, is platform, is distribution. Rather than using traditional avenues, going into digital, going into other spaces of that nature, um, what is that about? Is that, is that because you're getting richer data, or is it just that it's easier, there's less barrier, because you don't have to deal with a, a, a media platform. What, what is the, the thinking I behind think, that for, um, from a brand perspective? I mean, we know the world's changed, right? The, the ecosystem has changed. Consumers change. Consumers have more control of what they want to watch, when they want to watch it. A lot of the formats that we see that's been successful in the past were successful because it wasn't that choice. Today, people are watching that content, that short-form content. Take someone like PewDiePie, 45 million subscribers. He doesn't have a paid media plan behind him. That's bigger than most channels, and especially a lot of cable platforms in Southeast Asia. Um, so I think brands are looking at that and they're learning from it, um, part of that. I also think in the past, brands have in many ways been kept as cultural opportunists. Someone's decided we're gonna make this piece of content. Do you wanna jump on it? It's gonna be at this point in time. Brands can't do that anymore. They're locked into their own marketing schedules. They need to have more control. They need more flexibility. They also starting to understand cost of IP, continued cost if you're going to do season after season, and they want to start becoming more efficient with that. Um, beyond that, I think it's uh, about flexibility, how much control you have from a creative standpoint to weave in the messages that works for your brand within the format. How can you integrate and integrate? What talent access do you get? Uh, all very important parts. And I think the, the other, of course, big thing is cost. So when it comes to a channel, it will often be inflated by a lot of inventory. And that's what a lot of brands wanted in the past. Today, it's not so much about reach and frequency anymore because you need new messages if you're gonna take that much inventory. So paying three to four times the cost of production and the cost of the rights is not always the best thing. If you can get that a third of the price and then buy the distribution where you need it for the remaining two thirds. 
as a channel, I mean, this, this has an impact on your core business. I mean, how are you guys, uh, what are you doing to work around that or, or combat it? Well, first of all, yeah, the, the, the TVC, uh, as, we, as we knew it, is, is more and more challenging. So we have to adapt. Uh, we have to uh, look at other ways of uh, engaging the brand. So branded content is, is one, of the big, uh, <coughs> one, one of the big areas uh, that we are looking into. Uh, and, and, and really also trying to get into new platforms. So we, we are not just mainstream media broadcaster, we also got, get into uh, digital with Toggle. So we, we now have an offering that span across all the channels so that we can also offer uh, different ways for the brand uh, to distribute the content. Yeah. So ultimately, like, we, like these guys have mentioned, in the center of this triangle is an audience. They're all ultimately chasing an audience. I mean, whether you're a producer, a brand, a media agency, a channel, you all want to achieve the largest audience possible. And um, there are a number of different models that are starting to evolve to help in this or change it slightly. And one of the models is Group M Entertainment. Um, Group M uh, has a content financing arm called Group M Entertainment. Farah, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what Group M Entertainment's been yeah. doing. Yeah, so um, Group M Entertainment has been around for a while. We're um, more active, obviously, in the UK. Uh, started penetrating the Asian market um, five, six years ago uh, when the UK business started. So we're, we're basically a rights management uh, and content investment company. We produce, we produce lots of hours in the UK. We're starting to produce a lot more in Asia in several territories. Um, and also, we, you know, we, we work with IFA, that's how we co-produce as well, and we invest in uh, opportunities with, with, with partners, whether it's agencies and brands, whether it's producers or the channels. Um, the difference between Mikhail, for example, and, and us in, in GME under Group M is that I'm broadcaster facing, whereas they're brand facing. So that's where we coincide and we connect um, for great opportunities. That's where the triangle comes in. Um, and you see these opportunities, um, you know, falling together and creating great content out of this. Um, and broadcasters come to us, uh, and we do come in sometimes as, as consultants as well, because obviously as much as they know their audiences through ratings, being an uh, being a part of Group M and being Group M Entertainment, we have data that helps broadcasters to understand their audiences. So that's when um, that's the center, and that's always a drive for for broadcasters. Uh, so yeah, so so that's what we do: broadcaster facing, client facing, integration, <laughs> content financing. Yeah. Well, Mark, you've you've worked with uh, with Group M Entertainment. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about uh, how that worked from a producer's point of view. Sure. So we um, so so we, we will work as a, as a, a production house, but obviously uh, we're interested in uh, IP and developing our our, our own ideas. Um, th that's always got priority for us um, as an independent. Um, Partnering with GME makes sense uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is uh, scale. Uh, the, the group has relations with broadcasters by the very nature of, of um, uh, what they do in terms of uh, 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 brands, apart from anything else. So, so obviously, um, they have the, they, the ear of broadcasters, which means that we can get our ideas in partnership with, with GME in front of places where, let's be frank, we'd find it difficult to get an audience. Um, a good example of this was our format, Man Birth. Um, Man Birth is a show where we put, uh, we, we, we put guys through pregnancy, effectively. We, um, we, uh, we give them a, a, a big uh, belly, and it's specially modified to give them a, a pregnancy experience, and um, we follow them through a couple of trimesters and see how this changes their viewpoints and their relationships. So it's quite an unusual show. Uh, um, it's uh, not an obvious, not an obvious sell. And working together with uh, GME, um, we uh, we got that um, the broadcast in China on Beijing TV. Eventually, it rated number two in China uh, back in January, February of this year. Um, so I think you know a combination of 
great ideas origination from IFA in combination with, no question, uh, the connections and uh, intel that uh, GME brought um, really enabled us to turn what was quite an unusual idea into something which was, which was big. And that's now been picked up by Cachette and uh, uh, that's gonna, we're going to be announcing other territories for that broadcast very soon. So, um, so that's, that's an exciting partnership. And of course, you know, we're always trying to um, uh, conduct a two-way conversation with GME, trying to um, get our ideas in, you know, in front of channels that they're working with and, and they're feeding us intel on, on um, conversations they're having with broadcasters so that we can uh, cover way more ground, way more intelligently by working in partnership with them. Um, so it's just, it's, it's being flexible, I think, and, and uh, again, working in partnership to make sure that at the end, y you know, we, we make sure projects happen rather than uh, working in isolation and seeing them fail. So, so there's one corner now, the producer working with um, an entity that's related to a media agency, but sort of in the middle with the audience. GME is rather agnostic, can work with any one of the, the corners. Um, let's visit another corner, shall we? <laughs> um, Media platforms. Guillaume, you've also recently done a deal, or in the process of, of executing it, actually, with GME. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so the, when I started with uh, Foodies, right, the idea was how can we do things differently because we, we had a, a blank sheet of paper. How can we do things differently for MediaCorp? And the idea was rather to say we are going to create IPs just for MediaCorp, can we create brands? That means IPs that can travel, right? At the same time, Group M was also looking at how to strengthen the relationship with MediaCorp and how Group M Entertainment can be more involved uh, in the content creation uh, in partnership with MediaCorp, right? So this deal was really about uh, putting MediaCorp strengths in the Singapore market around uh, distribution and, and content production uh, together with Group M network to exploit. Uh, so what we are doing is uh, we are on, on a three-year uh, deal, and the idea is really uh, around um, co-investing in IP, selecting, acquiring, uh, producing content. And this content, what we want is really to have content that has, um, in a way, a, a, a Singapore or Southeast Asia DNA, but also a universal appeal, right? Uh, so we are in the midst of executing, uh, so we'll see where, what is the outcome. Uh, the first IP is, uh, is uh, a, a chef competition called Italy Star, uh, and, and we're quite excited about that. So again, it's, it's um, a, a different way in which these bits and pieces come together. Now the third element, I just, Mikhail, maybe you can say, are you able to work? I mean, given that you already are in a media agency, and as, as Ferris pointed out, um, you have broadcaster facing, you have brand facing, are you able to work with GME? Um, yeah, I mean, at, uh, at Mindshare, the way we look at our relationship with our clients is we are the trusted advisors. Um, so as part of that, what we do is we have an open source uh, called Creative, and we always look for what's best for the client. So we analyze any proposals that comes in. We look at what value exchange to be offered to the client, what risks are involved, how well does it fit the brand, et cetera. And if GME brings an opportunity that's better than what, what, what the other opportunities on the table are, we can look at that, yeah, certainly. Uh, but it's very important to highlight that whenever that's the case, because we sit within the same holding group, we do have to declare to clients that the group has an interest or a stake in that same property. And uh, that often leads to us uh, negotiating slightly yeah. harder <laughs> with these guys than someone else, because we have to work hard to prove to the client that we have their best interests at heart. Um, and I think the other occasions, and we sometimes work with GME as well, is where we've got clients who are looking at a, a larger format. They are really wanting to do it. They're putting significant investment in. Probably the same way that we would work with a channel. I'd say well, they would put the tightest sponsorship investment in. But there's still a gap. The channel's not willing to take the risk. Then we can approach GME to say, do you think we can put in additional money to this and find the rest of the sponsors? Can you give me an example of that? Um, yeah, so um, we've been doing uh, <coughs> um, Thailand Got Talent in, uh, in Thailand for the last four years for Unilever. It's been an uh, AFP, so ad funded production, entirely by Unilever themselves. Uh, they were considering cancelling the show, because not because it wasn't working, 
it was delivering result, it was definitely bringing in the audience, um, but it just took too much effort from the organization and the brand team, and they were downsizing, they're under a lot of financial pressure, so then we approached GME to say, you only willing to do this, they do not want to pay the whole thing, but they're willing to put in what we would pay for a title sponsorship on Channel 3 in Thailand for a prime time time show. Or you interested to take it over, here's the success of the show. Um, great, so what we have here, and this, I mean, I know we're kind of, I'm from GME, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I know, but ultimately what I'm trying to point out here and what we're all kind of discussing and, and, and circling around here is that this traditional triangle is changing. And I know I keep saying it, but it's, it's changing in ways that we may see in the next level of discussion here that it's actually going to break before too long or turn into a circle or a square or something else. But so just to that point, maybe you could tell me a little bit, Farah, about where you see the future of uh, GME um, and, you know, where do you see it going? Well, with, with this triangle, it's constantly evolving, the evolving audiences that we get across territories, across region, across the globe. So w when that happens, we have no choice but to evolve with it. So I see, I see GME squaring it up, um, I think, coming in as pure finances um, and, and financing a piece of content. But apart from acquisitions and syndications that we have uh, been doing actively, for example, in Indonesia, time blocking in you know, Thailand, um, I think that we will be working closely together with a lot, of, lot more producers like IFA, um, probably partnering up with brands as well, within the, uh, sitting within the agencies in Group M, and, and evolving those ideas and co-developing those ideas and co-producing them to create great content. I mean, we can still do uh, what we're doing now and, and acquiring you know, existing formats that, that's, that we know are already doing really well globally. But what the future holds, I think, is, is, is ideas, new ideas and producing those ideas and making that next big thing, whether or not we would end up doing that. But I, I, I think you know, if, if we keep doing that, um, in the next 10 years, maybe we will have the next big thing that we can then exploit out of Singapore, for example, or we can exploit out of Indonesia. So I see that evolving um, as we go because the audiences will always uh, be craving for, for, for new, better content um, on several platforms, uh, not just linear um, media. So yeah, I, I see it more, call it a square or a circle, but it'll, it'll be a 360 partnership and 360, yeah. Just opportunities, really. One of the things we were talking about sort of in the, in the green room uh, that came up was how each point on the triangle, um, they're all starting to eat each other's lunch a little bit. And we've touched on that a bit in the sense that we have a channel that is also a producer. We have media agencies that are also bringing on production and sometimes uh, involving themselves in platforms uh, and you know, potential ownership of, of a distribution channel. Um, maybe we can just talk about that for a minute as, as something that's evolving in terms of each of your er areas of expertise. Let me start with Guillaume. In terms of the kinds of investments that, that Media Corp is making um, that you know, are not in the traditional uh, model. Yeah, and, and, and for us, we see that um, this, this intermediation uh, is is uh, is obviously affecting us with the brands trying to get closer to the audience. Sometimes producing their own content, owning their own uh, platform to engage their audience. Right. So for us, uh, we are looking at how can we play in in that game as well. Not just being uh, a broadcaster with a production and producing only for our channels. Right. So there are two areas uh, that that we have been uh, exploring and 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 evaluating, right? One is really uh, multi-channel network, MCN. Um, last year, we invested in a company in Indonesia called Kapanlagi. Uh, very different animal from, from Mediacorp. Uh, digital publisher, uh, digital natives, very fast in deciding, uh, understanding digital audience, digital monetization, and so on. Uh, they are uh, already moving into the MCN space with, with a, a product called Famous. So we, we, are, we have invested also to learn from them and, and, and to really see how we can build uh, our own um, engagement with, with, with those uh, 
YouTubers, bloggers, content creators, and so on, right? So that's uh, one aspect. The other aspect, which, which is related, right, is really uh, do we continue to work with just our production house and maybe a few of the, of the production houses in the market, or do we reach out to all the content creators, some of them being at home and, and producing really good content? So we are look also looking at how we can uh, look at platforms to really uh, bring together um, the channels, but also the brands, as well as the, the creators. So these are the things uh, we look at in the digital space that we think will help us transform into a, a not just a mainstream, but a digital player. Going where the audiences are. Sorry? Going where the audiences are. Exactly, yeah. And how do you see the future then? I mean, is it, will, I mean, this is the big question, right? I mean, traditional television, linear television. I mean, as you guys diversify into all of these sort of, you know, MCNs and digital players who are, they look nothing like traditional linear television. What happens to your core business? Well, I think at the moment we still see that uh, we need that core business. We, we, there are still a number of, of audiences and brands that want that mainstream media, that mass appeal. Uh, but at the same time, we know we need to transition to the digital space. So it's, it's a parallel uh, evolution where we have launched Toggle, which is the first step into the OTT space, and now we are looking beyond, which is really, as I said, right, uh, do we need to have our own MCN? Uh, how do we deal with, with uh, the, the, the big digital giants? I mean, we, we didn't talk about them, but the frenemies, uh, the, the, the Google and Facebook and so on, right? So this is where we are looking at uh, for the futures. Uh, we know we can't uh, ignore them, so how can we can we work with them? Okay. Yeah. And yes. Thank you for raising uh, Facebook and Google as the uh, the, the gorilla in the room. Um, <coughs> Mikhail, just on that note, um, I know that within uh, under Group M, some of the other agencies have dedicated content teams who are creating content. Um, I know that some of the brands are are putting production companies inside. As you've said, they're, they're going direct to consumers rather than uh, going through a, a gatekeeper like a channel. Can you just comment a bit on the future of that, where you see that going? Yeah, I think um, part of that future is already here today, right? So you don't just watch Game of Thrones on TV or on your iPad or your laptop. You are seeing memes with it that's consumer created. You're seeing short vines that people are doing in imitation, so forth. And that's what brands are doing, really, and that's what they've been doing all the time. They've always built advertise and put that in different platforms. What they are trying to do more of, I think, is creating the right content for the right platform and not putting all eggs in one basket and just go on big on TV. Um, and we're seeing a lot of interest in that. Part of that is because of the rich data you get from, from the digital ecosystems. And that's where we see massive investment from clients as well, to building out their own DMPs, to be able to track the audience, follow the audience, and hit the audience with the right message at the right time. Um, and part of that will be content. So who knows, in five years, maybe we don't need one network. Maybe you can show the, the number, of the episode you need to show them on three different platforms because that's where the audience is coming in at that point in time. Yeah, and, and that's why uh, last year, we went as part of our reorganization, it was to say that uh, let's not organize ourselves by platform, but let's organize ourselves by audience because once you know the audience, uh, you know what they want, where they want it, then it's easier to produce the content and the format that will match the platform they are on, right? So uh, we are still in that transition, but we think that that's the way to, work, to go forward. So it's diversification of, of delivery strategy, really. So figuring out where the audience, again, the audience is in the middle, so figuring out where that audience is and achieving that audience through whatever method. So the top point is kind of it's still there as a distribution idea, but it's less monolithic, yeah? Yeah, yeah both that, and I also think it's about being able to tell richer stories. So having a great story is a, a great starting point today. It's not enough to cut through. It's experience that you deliver around it, and then deliver out and break that experience up into its own pieces of content. Are you talking about making it more two-way, the story, so that the, the user is more involved rather than just consuming content? They're At times, yeah or showing how users were involved, for example, becomes a big story in itself. Mark, just on, um, from a producer's point of view, 
I mean, it sounds like you've got, you know, frenemies to the left and the right here, in the sense that their own production companies, they're heading towards doing more production. The uh, scale of traditional television is falling into these small little bite-sized chunks. How are you guys adapting and dealing with that? <laughs> well, ev everyone here, um, as although we're all relating to that audience in the middle, everyone has their own loyalty relation to that audience. As M Mikkel says, you know, his, his loyalty is to his clients, his brands, and, and that's right. You know, he, he's there to advise uh, on, on, on the, the best media strategy for his clients. He wouldn't be doing his job unless he, he was doing that. And from Guillaume's side, his loyalty is to his, his brand, the, the media core brand, we're, we're, however that's, um, whichever platform that's on, uh, and, the, and the media core sub brand, so that it could be Channel 5 or wh wh whatever, whatever um, of those sub brands. And, 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 and that's right, as, uh, again. Our loyalty is, is really um, o only to the viewer in the sense that it's our job to make the, uh, the, the best content to brief for an appropriate audience, and, uh, and that's it. And, and therefore, um, our, our job is, is purely to advise on uh, and to deliver the, uh, the content that does that most effectively. Now, um, are we eating each other's lunch? Kind of, but, because, but that's because content itself has become much more important relative to five years ago. Um, you know, if, if, content is, if content is the key to getting, uh, to getting uh, uh, viewers and consumers um, excited, then we're all going to have an interest in, in how that's developed. Um, but what it isn't is, uh, and I think we, we, need to, uh, we need to be careful of this, is having a race to the bottom of, of simply producing content for content's sake. Ultimately, again, you know, it's, it's going to be viewers that decide this, and, and there's no shortage, as everyone said, there's no shortage of content anymore. It's not like the old days of linear TV. There's more than enough content to watch, and viewers are going to vote with their feet or vote with their eyes, always gravitating towards the stuff which they find entertaining. And, and I, I see it's the producer's side to keep that eye on that particular ball. Um, just want to clarify that. We're not looking to create content in-house ourselves. We're looking to have more ownership of the content, be able to point to oh, people but, who but, want. But, yeah. but so some, some media agencies, some of your media agencies are, do, are doing that, aren't they? I mean, you, you are having, you, you do have, yeah. yeah. All right, we have a few minutes left. Uh, let me throw the out to the floor. Are there any questions for the panel? Anyone? Bueller, Bueller. All right, um, well then, let's, I'll, I'll take the lead from the, the last panel. Where do you guys see this, all of this in, not five years, 10 years? Let's look a little further, what considerably further down. Where do you think? I have to stop? Yes, <laughs> no time to think. Um, <clears throat> well, 10 years down the road, uh, is a long time, yes, we, there is someone who said, you know, we over, always overestimate uh, what will happen in the, in, the, in the next year and underestimate what will happen in five, right? So uh, I think it will be definitely a completely different world. I think your triangle will be, I don't know what it will be. Uh, things will be much more about uh, the audience. It will be much more about uh, personalization. It will be even more so about you know, where I want to be and, and what I want to watch at which point, right? So I think for us, it will be a couple of things, right? One, we need to adopt uh, new technologies. We need to adapt. Uh, we need to be ready to disrupt ourselves. Uh, otherwise, we'll be disrupted and, and in 10 years, you, we won't be around. Mark? Well, I think there's going to be many more and unforeseen platforms that, that, that we, we really can't see yet, and I, I think that, uh, you know, clearly that, that's going to proliferate as, as technology becomes uh, uh, cheaper and, and, and more widely available. Um, I mean, in 10 years, I mean, that, that's, that's a big ask, because I think, you know, potentially in 10 years, I think the, for, the very form of content may change. Um, you know, people, are t uh, I, peop I think VR may indeed, over that time scale, not in five years, but I think VR in 10 years m may indeed become important. And I definitely think that, um, interactivity with content is going to become uh, much more important during that time. 
Uh, I, I think that uh, content as a passive experience will be will still exist, but I th but I think that many viewers will expect to have something in ten years which they can uh, interact with on, in a in a live sense. And finally, just the one thing I've noted: both neither of you have mentioned anything about content financing. You really concentrated, and rightly so, on the content itself and the audience. So I'll leave it for, for Mikhail to make a comment on the financing, <laughs> because you know, generally speaking, that is your part of the triangle. Um, in terms of audience is important, content is even more important, is, is the message I'm, I'm hearing from all of you. How are we gonna pay for it all, and will, what, what does that look like? I think that's why a lot of client organizations are investing very heavily in the data today, because they wanna be getting first and closest to the audience. And the closer they get to the audience, the more of the money can they put into creating content directly for that audience, instead of funneling that money through a channel or through a platform. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think advertising is going to go away. It's going to get more regulated. You're going to have to work even harder, be smarter, better ideas, much richer experiences um, within that. Uh, but I also think that triangle is probably not going to be um, hexagon at least. It's probably a lot more edges to it over that time. It's going to shrink again and then grow again over 10 years. Uh, and at the end of that, uh, hopefully, Group M is still there. Probably they bought Facebook and Google. <laughs> And Farah, the final word, just in terms of uh, financing again. Well, um, I think content can get really expensive to produce now, as it is 10 years down the road, it will probably be even bigger. Um, and the budget's gonna be a problem. So that's when the synergy is important. And, and I, I foresee in 10 years time that broadcasters who, who, who weren't previously open to, to having this synergy and, and, and not wanting it to take all in-house, start doing all these partnerships more um, and seeing, seeing a lot more value and return on investments, really, and de-risking it all. The more people like us doing a piece of content or producing a piece of content, that de-risks de everything. And I think that synergy is really important. And I think we'll be seeing more of that hopefully in five to 10 years time. Well, thank you very much. We're, we're more than, uh, we're way out of time. We're actually running long. Oh, we have a question. Sure. Yeah, we'll go for that. Hello. Hi. I'm from Thailand, uh, from True Corporation. So we're relatively a new broadcaster. And I'm familiar with this triangulation approach but it seems to be only available for the leading channels. Uh, are there different models for, for the, the not the leading channels? Or is this right now focused on the top channels since uh, the media agency seems to invest most in the highest reach channels at the moment? I'll, I'll answer part of that, and then I'll throw it over to these guys. But the. The one thing I will say, though, that this model doesn't talk about, because we're really here talking about an advertiser-funded model, there obviously is the subscriber model as well. And that, that, that is another source of, of revenue for places like Netflix and HBO, et cetera, et cetera. And, and cable channels are, are living off a, a hybrid of, of subscriber and advertiser-funded models. Um, what you're talking about is the scale, I, I assume you're saying, that because it's a DTT channel. Yeah, so the reach is, is small, therefore it's not as appealing. Um, or, is there? Or, or is there, yeah, so, uh, well, actually I'll throw it first to Mikhail, just because, you know, for you, it is about audience and the revenue coming in. Yeah, I think it really comes back to the brand and the, the target audience they're going after. Of course, a larger channel with more of the audience has a much easier selling to a lot of clients looking for mass awareness. But there's a lot of briefs where we are looking for niche solutions. That's really spot on for a, for a smaller se target segment group or for a specific uh, messaging platform or a specific product. Uh, and certainly, I mean, the same model could work for them. I think obviously, if you don't have as much leverage as a large network like a media corp, the clients will push you hard to deliver more value back. Because in the end, it's about a value exchange. It's not about the cost. And the more we defragment the audience, the closer we get to individuals and target them specifically, the, the more you're going to measure that cost on how much of a quality engagement am I getting. 
and that's where more personalized to smaller networks can probably stand out. So yes, it's it's I, I would I would agree. I think it's it's about programming clarity of vision and achieving a quality audience. I think is ultimately it doesn't have to be huge. If I'm reading what you're saying correctly, it just has to be the right audience. Anyone else? Questions? Okay, we are way over time. Uh, thank you all. Uh, just have a round of applause for the for the panel.